The pelvis. Now when we are done with the hip bone anatomy and also when we are done with vertebrae and the spinal column in general, perhaps it's a good time for us to take another look and to observe pelvis, which is now composed, as you can see, of left and right sided hip bones that are connected to each other at the region which is called symphysis pubis. And in the background, we can see the sacrum and, of course, left and right sided sacroiliac joints that were formed. First, I'd like to introduce a set of different landmarks that are used to differentiate between false pelvis, which essentially is not even pelvis, but rather a lower part of the abdominal cavity, versus true pelvis. So if we start from the anterior midline, first we will find symphysis pubis. Then we can go along the pubic crest, either side, until we reach the pubic tubercle. From pubic tu tubercle, further along the superior ramus of pubis, we will go along the pectin pubis until we reach the iliopubic eminence. From iliopubic eminence, we will go across the ala, following the arcuate line, and then we will finally reach the sacroiliac joint on either side. Sacroiliac joint, here is the arcuate line. That will take us to the sacrum, and the very last thing that we are adding as this kind of set of landmarks is the lumbosacral promontory. A bit of a spatial angle which projects itself into pelvic space, and as a result of that, it intrudes into what in the female pelvis would be a birth canal. The model that we have is typical male pelvis, which, as you can see, appears to be quite narrow, but also when measured superior to inferior direction. It is quite deep. Also, there will be several additional features, like narrow and more uh, pronounced curvature of the sacrum. Also, we can find out that infrapubic angle between the rami of left and right side pubic bone is also something that is a little bit more on the acute side, whereas in the typical female pelvis, it would be closer to obtuse angle. So what we have described is cumulatively known as the linea terminalis pelvis, so a set of all the different landmarks, observing them bilaterally, which separates what is above, becoming false pelvis, and whatever is the space that we have inferior to these landmarks is essentially pelvis minor or true pelvis. In order to make a little bit more use of this video, let us put the pelvis the way that it should fit in a living human body. Right now, it has been left to sit on a horizontal surface, but we would prefer to have it more tilted forward. So the tilt of pelvis is so significant that when you look from the side, practically, symphysis pubis and the anterior superior iliac spine are nearly in the same anatomical plane. So for us, pelvis obviously has this much of the anterior tilt. If we take a look at the pelvis from the posterior direction, now we can focus a little bit more on what is happening here in this area. Let us try to come much closer by zooming in. And two different, although same name, articular surfaces that will be in contact. They're called auricular surface of sacrum and auricular surface of the ilium. They will establish the sacroiliac joint, quite rough and rugged looking joint, but still considered synovial. Further, posterior to joint cavity itself, we would identify iliac and also we'll find sacral tuberosity. So this V-shaped space that exists between tuberosities of ilium and the sacrum is populated perhaps by strongest ligaments that exist within the human body, interosseous sacroiliac ligaments. Of course, the situation remains the same on the opposite side. Sacroiliac joint, sacral, 
and iliac tuberosity, and this is where we have those ligaments. What I wanted to present the pelvis entirely is to show a little bit more of a detail as what happens between sacrum and, in particular, ischial spines. Let us take a look on the left side. So this is area of the acetabulum. This is the ischium, ischial tuberosity, and this is the ischial spine. This is inferior sacrum, and here we have deep notch, greater sciatic notch, superior to the ischial spine, inferior to it, lesser sciatic notch. In a living person, notches are converted into greater and lesser sciatic foramina. Living person will have strong and massive ligaments that will be running from dorsal aspect of the sacrum onto ischial spine and also from dorsal aspect of sacrum a little bit more inferiorly in the direction of ischial tuberosity. Name for these ligaments are sacrospinous and sacrotuberous ligaments. So with the position of these ligaments, greater sciatic notch becomes greater sciatic foramen and primarily would allow sciatic nerve to come outside of the pelvis, pass next to piriformis muscle and then head into posterior compartment of the thigh. Lesser sciatic notch with two ligaments next to its vicinity will become the lesser sciatic foramen. And perhaps as the very last thing that we can use this model of pelvis is when we introduce the head of the femur. This is the left-sided acetabulum. Here we have the left-sided femur just to show what exactly would happen and what kind of mov movement can be produced at the hip joint. Obviously the movement that I'm now demonstrating is internal rotation of the femur, external rotation of the femur. This will be flexion and a little bit of extension. Finally, if we change the position, when the femur keeps going this way, it is abduction. So you can see here that there will be almost like a contact between the greater trochanter of the femur and outside surface of the iliac ala. And of course, movement in opposite direction, that would be adduction. One more look at the acetabulum to confirm that we have acetabular fossa, non-articular surface, surrounded by lunate or semilunar surface, that is articular surface covered with hyaline cartilage, and then we have this raised edge of the acetabulum, acetabular rim. This indented area at the inferior anterior part is known as the acetabular notch, and in a living person, the acetabular notch will be bridged by the transverse acetabular ligament that will go from side to side.